Hello everyone. Well, we've been looking at the early Kievan state that uh, takes its beginning essentially about the year 1000 when it received Christianity from Constantinople. Uh, we did touch uh, a bit upon the icon painting and today we'll look deeper into it. Well, we saw that to construct buildings in Kiev and the other cities, master craftsmen were brought from Byzantium, from Constantinople, because the Russians, well, they didn't know how to do it. Not yet. But, um, and the same will be the case, essentially, with the icons, as I mentioned last time. But uh, we'll look at it uh, more closely. But for that, we will go to Novgorod instead of Kiev, because um, the early Kiev, uh, while it was built uh, by the Byzantine masters, was then sacked and destroyed uh, on a number of occasions, not least by uh, the Russians themselves and then uh, the Mongols uh, who came in the 13th century. Uh, whereas Novgorod did not suffer the state and therefore whatever we do have left, we have uh, from Novgorod of the early icons. Um, it, here it is, the, uh, the, a number of chronicles, and the first chronicle first mentions Novgorod um, in uh, 862, and it was at this point presumably already part of uh, the Baltic to Byzantium route that Norsemen were eagerly pursuing. As you remember, the Norsemen, uh, some of them went west, towards England and northern France in the 9th century and then others went to Russia and through Russia to Byzantium. Uh, the, in Russia they were called Regents. The chapter, the actual chapter of Novgorod recognizes the year 859 as the year when uh, the city was first mentioned and uh, it is traditionally considered as uh, a cradle of uh, Russian statehood. It was called uh, Novgorod the Great or the Lord Great Novgorod. All of those names were applied to it because indeed it was, uh, it did develop into a very considerable city. One of the reasons it did was because of the Hanseatic League. And the Hanseatic League was both a commercial and a defensive federation of merchant guilds in um, the uh, northern and uh, central Europe. Uh, the, uh, they grew from some German towns uh, such as Hamburg and Lübeck and then they extended east to Danzig and uh, Riga, some of the islands in the Baltic and then finally to Novgorod. Uh, and the uh, Hansa territories stretched from the Baltic in fact to the north sea and inland during the Middle Ages. It began to decline in uh, the middle of the 15th century as the New World was about to be discovered and then the Portuguese will find the road to the Spice Islands so uh, the trade will um, go away. But while it lasted, Novgorod was in a very fortunate state. In fact, it developed the so-called Veche, which, is, which was the popular assembly and, um, and had the right to either appoint or dismiss their princes, which the princes um, did not like particularly. And with time uh, and with the help of Moscow, the Vecchi will be dissolved, as we shall see. However, here's the map that we had looked at before, and this is the map of the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde that uh, was one of the four major areas of uh, Mongol domination. This one was based in, in the city of Sarai on the Volga. It conquered all the territories up through the ones that you see in green. And as you see, Novgorod escaped that. It did not reach to Novgorod. Well, but uh, needless to say, they did cut off most of the routes, so it's not that Novgorod did not feel the pressure of, uh, 
of the Mongolo Tatars. It's just that the city itself was left in peace, relative peace. But nevertheless, there was no immediate uh, uh, Tatar-Mongol impact, and as a result, the churches were not destroyed, and the icons inside the churches were not destroyed either. So here is Novgorod. Here is Vladimir. Vladimir was uh, another great city in Suzdal. Moscow came into uh, an existence sometime in the 12th century, but still is a very tiny little village. Um, and then it will, uh, uh, after the 13th century, it will cooperate with the Mongols. It will become its chief agent for um, collecting of uh, dues from other Russian cities and in the 14th century Moscow. From the 14th century on, Moscow will be unstoppable and will ultimately become the greatest uh, city in Russia and will absorb all these territories here under its own dominion. But so far, Novgorod is independent. And as we saw last time, um, the Virgin Hodigetria that presumably, the original version of Hodigetria was presumably painted by Saint Luke. This is a prototype, there, were, there are hundreds of them, and this was originally the canon that one followed. The oldest icon in Russia is considered the Lady of Vladimir, which is the icon of tenderness, and the Russians will always maintain that they took uh, the, um, the very ceremonial art of Byzantium and gave it character and gave it tenderness, gave it humanity, so to speak. And this is what we see here, this is what we looked at last time. One of the earliest, also one of the earliest icons that does come from Novgorod, and this is Saint Peter and Paul. It is a tempera on wood, as uh, most of the icons were done. It was overpainted in the 16th century. Well, the problem with all the, the early icons is that they were restored and over-restored and restored again. And uh, the uh, so with, with these icons, one thinks of one of my favorite characters, Martinus Scriblerus, which was another name for Alexander Pope in the 18th century. He and uh, other brilliant writers uh, in London sort of formed a glee club and issued uh, writings of uh, uh, Martinus Scriblerus. And there is a, a very famous um, uh, stocking uh, that had been repaired so many times that no one really knows what that stocking looked like in the first, in the first place. Well, that's what uh, the Russian icons uh, the very early ones, alas, uh, today that's the case with the Russian icons. It is the case with Our Lady of Vladimir as well. Pretty much everything here is overpainted, uh, although, as I said last time, perhaps uh, some of the faces have remained, uh, uh, have retained the original paint. Same with uh, Peter and Paul. Here they stand. One hopes that the faces retain the original paint. They are obviously not in very good shape, the icons, but, uh, well, they have been overpainted. Uh, the garments are very much damaged. One can see, however, in the close-up that uh, the artist who did do this icon were quite familiar with chiaroscuro the art of, uh, uh, of painting with light and shade and thus creating pleats in drapery with light and dark rather than just straight lines as will often be the case later. All these artists came from Byzantium. We are still very much dealing with the Byzantine tradition. It's just that having come to Russia and, le and learned Russian, they were uh, immersed in the Russian culture and uh, that's why the icon specialists can see definite differences in uh, Byzantine icon painting in Russia as opposed to Byzantine icon painting in Byzantium. Well, here they are. They are still very much in the Byzantine tradition. Um, Christ's head appears up above, giving his blessing and as you see, the proportions are very, very elongated. Uh, the head is about one-ninth of the body, and we'll see it appear and disappear 
uh, time and time again depending on how much stature the painter wished to give to, um, to his subjects. Still another one that uh, we don't exactly uh, know the date but it was definitely a pre-Mongolian uh, icon. In other words, icon that's painted before the Mongolian invasion in the early 13th century and all of those are extremely valuable uh, in Russia, needless to say. It was uh, the main icon of the Yuryev Monastery for a long time. Now it's in Moscow, in the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow. The date is unknown, as I said, but 1130 is agreed upon because it is a date on the back of the icon. That doesn't mean that that was the date of painting. It could have been earlier. And um, the foundation of the monastery itself dates a uh, hundred years back to about 1030. So the icon essentially could be anywhere from the middle of the 11th century to the middle of the 12th century. Um, unlike Peter and Paul, here, who seem to have an easy, an easy stance. Um, we don't see, well, we even see a bit of contraposto here, uh, with Peter projecting his knee slightly forward, which indicates that his weight would be on his right leg, and his left leg is slightly projected, which is the classical way of depicting a human body, and uh, this artist clearly knew the technique. Uh, here there is none of this. Uh, Saint Michael stands very rigidly. He is holding his lance and then there is a sword looking straight forward. Uh, the, uh, the lance indicates him as a warrior saint. The sword also a warrior saint but also of princely pedigree. There is a back on this icon but the uh, actually the back itself was only made in the 19th uh, century. There's a, a definite interest in color and uh, pattern. Uh, a red will always be very popular with Russians and there's quite a bit of red here. And then pattern on his stocking, pattern on his tunic. Um, the Russians will love pattern and will utilize pattern um, greatly and this is just one of the early examples of, uh, of such uh, of such interest. We don't know, we never know who painted these pre-Mongolian um, icons uh, because uh, Peter and Paul uh, seem to be painted with a greater skill than St. Michael. It's possible that this uh, may have been one of the Russian masters who had learned from the Greeks but did not yet uh, know about contraposto or giving a lifelike appearance to a standing body. As a result, he is quite rigid. Uh, they're, they're also very, very large. And the Byzantine icons were not that large. I mean, this one is 2.3 meters, and uh, an average human size is 1.5 meters. So you can imagine how huge this is in its height. It's very, very tall, which it also distinguishes it from the Byzantine icons that were considerably smaller. Here's another one, also very large. Uh, it's uh, over two meters, and this is of Saint George. On the other side is the image of Hodegetria, and as you see, this image had been, again, uh, restored or restored. We really don't know what these pieces looked like, uh, Christ child or her face, so what we see here are just restores guesses. Saint George here has a very clear face, has enormous eyes, which was uh, a canon in uh, Byzantine art, and we see it already in the head of Constantine the Great uh, back in the 4th century uh, AD, but this canon continued, so the eyes as uh, projecting inner spirituality will always remain very large. Uh, the eyes are very much emphasized by the arched 
eyebrows, a strict nose. Seems the face may also have been restored. The hair is very carefully brushed on. The locks of hair look almost like shells and again a lot of red. So our St. George has a lot of red as well and this is circa 1100 which is about a hundred years after the uh, the uh, beginning of Christianity in um, in Russia, so it's for Russia. This is a very early piece of art. And here we see it. Uh, we see a close-up, small uh, small mouth, very very straight nose. Here, there is no uh, indication yet of the tip of the nose going down. Is it? as we will see a bit later. This one is lovely, actually. Uh, it's the Ustug Annunciation, which is early 12th century. And here we have the Annunciation, the, uh, the very canonical theme in the Christian uh, iconography of Archangel Gabriel uh, coming down to earth, announcing to Mary uh, that she shall conceive uh, the moment his words reached her ears, uh, the incarnation of Christ happened in her body. And um, this is the theme, and uh, the face is lovely. Um, the face is quite lovely because it has a degree of urgency to it, and that is uh, remarkable and, uh, and quite individualistic. Even though the eyes, are, well, the eyes are still large, all the the, can the canonical ideas of icon painting are observed here. But when compared even with St. George, who is just staring to the side without much emotion, with this painting it's quite different. And as I said, the urgency is very much there. And here actually, here's that nose that uh, I mentioned before, with the tip of the nose uh, slightly turning down. Uh, and we will see it often, the, um, the forehead is small, there's a diadem in the hair, the hair itself is done with gold striations, and that's what we see, the gold striations as opposed to chiaroscuro, which is light and dark. Uh, the neck is uh, strongly emphasized, uh, so is the drapery, a lot of it is striation, as you see with the uh, gold streak. Um, there's some degree of uh, chiaroscuro, but not much. Also, his stance, as you see, is awkward. It's not uh, the contraposto stance of uh, Saint Peter that we saw. And uh, the Madonna appears darker and uh, has not survived as well as, uh, as the angel. Uh, the, um, Still another image, it's, it's, uh, it's called the image of Edessa or Mandelian image, which is a holy face. And it goes to the long tradition of Veronica's veil and the, um, uh, the shroud of Turin, all the stories about contemporaries taking the liking of Christ, whether, the, whether as in the case of uh, Veronica, uh, she uh, she gave him her cloth and uh, he wiped his face with it and the face then survived. Or in the case of Saint Luke who presumably depicted Hodegetria, the Virgin Mary, with Christ's child. And uh, here is another story of, uh, of someone asking Christ for his assistance against his enemies. Christ responded that he couldn't, that was the ruler of Edessa but he promised to send a messenger and presumably the messenger was sent by the name of Ananias and uh, who very fortunately also happened to be a painter and as a result he uh, took the likeness of Christ, he painted it and then brought it to Edessa, kept in the royal palace and, uh, and consequently helped them defeat their enemies. There's a first mention of something uh, about this story in uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, uh, but uh, it uh, caught on and it became one of the traditions uh, and the image of Edessa, it is called the Holy Face. It looks, uh, again, very Byzantine, very Christ Pantocrator, 
uh, very much sort of a threatening uh, crest. And uh, they obviously liked for the eyes, not always to lo look straight at us, but also look to the side as if thinking of uh, the next move, as we see it here. And you also see these gold striations here very well, which they used to denote uh, strands of hair or, for that matter, the pleats in the garment. Interestingly, however, the beard is done uh, with much more delicacy. And it is known that uh, an icon painter very rarely painted alone. There were always companionships of these painters. Uh, they were called Druzhina in Russian. And uh, one painter would do one part and another painter would do another part. So there is no surprise that the hair on the head may appear done by one master, but then the beard may appear to have been done by another. And this is the case here, because the beard definitely appears to have been done by a different hand. On the other side of uh, our image of Odessa is the worship of the cross. And here we have a typical uh, Russian cross. We'll look at the Russian crosses at the end and um, we'll see what they are like. I mean, there are all sorts of different shapes of crosses. There's the Vatican cross, there is, um, there's the Constantinople cross, there's the Russian cross, even the Russian crosses there are many, Maltese cross, etc., etc. Well, the Russian cross usually looks like this. The upper portion, this is where uh, the name of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, uh, King of uh, Judea, is uh, usually carved. Then the next piece of wood is where the arms, the hands were attached. And then the piece here usually indicates, well, for one thing, is the, uh, the step for the crucified person to step on in the Russian cross. Not, it, it's, it's often turned, as you see it, uh, because on the right hand of Christ, uh, there was a thief who agreed to, uh, to be converted on the cross and thus went to heaven. And the one on the left side of Christ is the one who went to hell because he decided, well, uh, I've lived my life the way I've lived it and it's a little too late to change. Um, so no, I will not convert. He went to hell. Uh, and, uh, and then later on in, last in the last judgments, we, uh, we see that on the right uh, side of Christ uh, during the Last Judgment, there are always the righteous who rise to heaven, and then on the left side of Christ, there are always the uh, sinners who are cast down to hell. So this is what this um, part is. Uh, underneath, this is supposed to be uh, the Mount Calvary, or Golgotha, which is in Greek the Mount of the Skull, and the white portion here, the white bit that we see here, that's the skull of Adam. Because uh, according to her geology, because according to tradition, uh, Christ's uh, blood washed off the sins of Adam. Christ was crucified on the spot where Adam was buried. Uh, on the uh, obverse, we also see this continuation of uh, Russian love for pattern. And here is uh, the, the patterning. Uh, the angels on each side are worshipping the cross, and what they indicate, they indicate uh, uh, the lance uh, with which Christ was uh, wounded on the right side uh, to check whether he was still alive. And here is the sponge with vinegar that was given to Christ, and that was done from his left. So that's what these are. And then seraphims up above, all of them have names. So Russian icons did inherit the very obliging Byzantine custom of uh, writing down who is who, which is, uh, which is very helpful. So here's our Ustug Annunciation, and here is still another icon that's called the Angel of the Golden Locks. Comes from the early 12th century, and as I said, the icons from that time are so rare that they are that they're extremely valued. And uh, so here it is, and you can see the similarity between the two of them, and they are in fact done approximately at the same time. 
and it's very possible that uh, it may be the same companionship of people that uh, went from one town to another because this was all Novgorod uh, area and uh, the two of them this one, this one appears almost uh, slightly smiling the hair is very similar, the diadem in the middle, there are bangs added here, but then we saw the bangs added here as well. Otherwise, faces are quite similar, and, uh, and there's that same nose that we saw on those two annunciation with the tip just curving down slightly. The uh, Dormition of the Virgin is um, slightly older, it comes from about 12 hundred and uh, it shows de the death of the Virgin. Her soul is about to ascend to heaven and here is Christ holding her soul in his hands about to depart with her to heaven and uh, they are surrounded by the Apostles. Uh, this Apostle perhaps is uh, most expressive as he actually bends down uh, to uh, to the sarcophagus to to search the face of the Virgin as if to say goodbye but at the same time he knows he's pointing to heaven he knows that uh, that she will go to heaven and that this is not the end but just but only the beginning uh, the balance is lovely. It's a very balanced, very symmetrical composition. And again, as I said, it's probably done by the Byzantine artists. It's possible that the Russian artists are helping, but they're still perhaps nowhere as masterful as the Byzantine artists. And uh, here's still another, John Klimakos. Uh, the background now becomes red, and, uh, and, and again, Russians will just love red. John Klimakos uh, here actually is uh, another icon. This one is not a Russian icon. It's from Mount Sinai in Egypt. Uh, it um, goes back to the 12th century, so it's sort of contemporaneous with the painting of the Russian icons. And Klimakos is because he climbs up the ladder uh, as he is followed uh, by other monks to, uh, uh, to ascend to heaven. And the angels are there waiting for him. So here he is, John Climacus, and Christ is welcoming him in his embrace. There are a lot of apocryphal stories about uh, various saints, and he was considered an important saint in Russia. Here he stands uh, rather rigidly, quite rigidly in fact, surrounded by Saints George and Saint Blaise. And these are on each side, and because uh, clearly to these painters, neither St. George nor St. Blaise seemed as important. Our St. Climacus, he is considerably larger. Uh, it's all, it's very two-dimensional. There's not even a hint of a third dimension here. He looks very much an ascetic. The face is that of an ascetic, very stern face as he holds uh, the, uh, the holy book under his left arm and blesses us with his right. Uh, this is an interesting one because we actually know the name of, um, of the artist and his name is Alexei Petrov, who was, we know, a Russian icon painter uh, of the late 13th century now and he is the author of Saint Nicholas the Wonder Worker and Saint Nicholas was extremely popular in, um, in Russia and it was painted for the Church of Saint Nicholas near Novgorod and the reason we know who painted it is because very conveniently there is an inscription and the inscription indicates the year 1294 and the name of Alexei Petrov. Isn't that wonderful? And isn't that very obliging of whoever wrote that down for us? The iconography, the basic iconography of the, um, of the image is still very quite Byzantine, but again, he is looking to the side. The face is rather expressive, in fact. And then various um, uh, church figures are on the margins of the uh, of the icon. This uh, icon is done in the original method as uh, I 
I talked about uh, in the previous lectures, where the center of the icon is actually carved out uh, with the uh, ridges left. And it's on these borders, ridges, that these uh, other persons are painted here. And here we come to the most important uh, icon of Novgorod, which I actually mentioned in the previous lecture, and that is Our Lady of the Sun, here. Uh, she is in the Oranz style. This is the Oranz style, and it is uh, Oranz means one who is uh, praying or pleading. Uh, and um, it's this kind of style, and uh, it's not just Christian, and it goes back uh, to, to remote antiquity when one wanted to supplicate whatever deity. In Christianity, later on, it will be replaced with uh, putting one's hands together. But uh, in many early images we see the Aran style. This one, in fact, comes from um, the early catacombs in Rome before Christianity was um, legalized by Constantine in the early 4th century. Um, now, this one is one of the most revered icons, and uh, it is the main symbol of Novgorod of Novgorod's sovereignty, of Novgorod's republicanism, and it is still in the Novgorod Cathedral. Amazingly, Moscow did not appropriate it, so it is um, still very much there. It's 12th century, and on the obverse we see um, Joachim and Anna, and they are the parents of, um, of the Virgin. Whereas here is the Virgin, it's a very, again, it's a Byzantine image, and she shows incarnate Christ inside uh, her in this image as uh, she is uh, praying. Uh, and then Jesus Christ here is indicated in the half moon image, right there. Now, this is what it looks like really inside the cathedral. It's, uh, it's a very ancient image and, uh, well, needless to say, it's sat for centuries in front of uh, uh, of candles and oil lamps and what have you, so it's not in the best of shape. But uh, as I said, well, here's what it's supposed to, to look like. That is the icon that I talked about. Here are the close-ups. Here is uh, the Virgin, so you can see it better, with Christ incarnate. And this is the face of uh, Joachim, which actually is done very, very um, sensitively, I feel, and, um, and very warmly. And that's how Russians did feel about their, their icons, whether painted by themselves or by the Byzantines. Um, they res very much respected their ceremonious um, role, but they also felt about them as sort of human beings. They were, especially the icons in, uh, in people's houses, they were part of the family. Uh, they were to be talked to, they were to be included at dinner, they were to be communicated to. They were very much part of one's life on a regular basis. They were treated as, uh, well, very saintly human beings, but nevertheless human beings. And uh, you can see it here in the face of uh, Joachim. Uh, I did mention the icon uh, in the previous lectures, and that is the very icon, the icon of the sign that, um, that uh, defended Novgorod against Suzdal. As you remember, when Suzdal was about to attack, uh, then the, um, the city elders went to the cathedral, took the icon, brought it to the Kremlin. On the way, however, uh, the Suzdalians were attacking it, as you see it here. Then the war ensued, and with the sign from the Virgin, the Virgin of the sign, uh, the Novgorodians were successful. This icon itself is a post-Mongolian icon. The icon de dates to the second half of the 15th century, at which point Moscow had destroyed Novgorod. And, but uh, still the city persevered, and the icon was painted. Uh, and here are the close-ups. Uh, here is the original cathedral. The icon right here is being taken from the cathedral, brought over to uh, the Kremlin, the people uh, bowing before the icon. 
And here are the Susdalians who are attacking the icon, actual icon, with uh, their arrows, uh, which uh, absolutely horrified the Novgorodians. And then the war ensues here, and the Novgorodians are Victorian. You saw this last time. And now the Russians are really getting into it. Uh, they love stories, and uh, well, this is an opportunity to depict stories. And here is a quadripartite icon. And uh, this one is already post Mongolian. It's the end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th century. And what the Mongols didn't do to Novgorod, the Russian Tsars will, between Ivan III. Uh, and his grandson, Ivan the Terrible, they will destroy Novgorod. But so far, not yet. This icon depicts four scenes, and if we go clockwise, we have the uh, raising of Lazarus, then the Trinity, then John the Evangelist dictating his gospel to Prochorus, and then finally the presentation at the temple. I have a couple of close-ups. Here they are. And uh, this is the same image of uh, the Trinity that last time we saw by Rublev. And I told you the story how basically it is part of a narrative. And the narrative, the narrative whereby three angels come uh, to Abraham's tent. And uh, he doesn't know they're angels because they're in the, in the guise of uh, just travelers. He feeds them, he and Sarah feed them. And then they predict that uh, despite their very advanced age, Abraham and Sarah will have a son. And uh, usually uh, the story is depicted as a narrative. Uh, and it is depicted as a narrative here, to an extent. Because here we do see Abraham and Sarah. They're not as large as uh, the angels because this is very much a hierarchical approach where more important people are bigger than less important people, but here they are offering them food and the angels are sitting at the table thanking them and blessing them, as you see. So that's the story here, a lot of red, love red. And um, this one is here and the uh, Prochorus, Prochorus. Um, we don't really know who he was. Um, supposedly he was a disciple of St. John. It's also very possible that one Prochorus in fact wrote the uh, Gospel of St. John. But uh, just to make it convenient, the story uh, uh, appeared that St. John in fact had a disciple and that he dictated his Gospel to him as the eagle had dictated the Gospel to St. John in his own turn. Uh, what is interesting here, these are Byzantine conventions whereby a piece of rock is taken from the outside, brought into the space where the icon is being painted and turned into rocks. We see something similar actually in the Sienese painting back in the, um, in the 14th century, 13th century. Uh, and here is the convention where a head is just very small compared to the body. In this case, if this man were to get up, the head would probably be one-tenth, one-fifteenth of the body. The body here looks like one of those mountains. He is uh, the Rock of Wisdom. He is the uh, St. John the Evangelist. And at his feet uh, sits his disciple. Uh, needless to say, the the painters of this icon did not understand perspective at all. They try here, they try to sit him on a chair, but then the, um, the legs of the chair are on the same level, so they just, they don't know. But uh, St. John himself looks uh, to the side almost as if expecting the eagle to appear because uh, uh, all four evangelists, as I had mentioned before, had their uh, the beast of the apocalypse, and uh, St. John's was the eagle, and those were the beasts that dictated uh, the scriptures to the evangelists. Um, St. Mark uh, with his winged uh, lion, and then St. Luke with the winged bull, and uh, St. Matthew with the angel, and then St. John 
with the ego, but the ego is not uh, indicated here. Uh, still another very red uh, icon. Uh, this we are now into the post-Mongolian period and uh, uh, it's uh, in the Tritsukov gallery. It was done by Novgorodian painters. Also, once Moscow destroyed Novgorod, they brought Novgorodian craftsmen and painters to Moscow. Very similarly, in fact, uh, to the Mongols when they destroyed Kiev, they captured craftsmen and painters and uh, brought them either to Sarai or further to Mongolia to their own courts to work there. Well, Moscow learned its lessons very well from the Mongols uh, in politics, in economics, but also in art. And uh, as a result, when it, w when it destroys Novgorod, it will bring Novgorodian painters to Moscow. Uh, Christ in Majesty, again, very tall. If this man were to, to get up, he would probably have the same proportions as our Saint John. He is enveloped in his garments. Striation is everywhere. He does seem to be uh, seated in this enormous chair, which is, again, very Byzantine. The throne is represented as a beautiful chair and uh, the uh, garment is indicated with striation and he has his bangs indicated on his face. Another, um, another quadripartite icon, which is actually quite fascinating, uh, well a couple of things there are fascinating. Now clockwise, the scourging of Christ here, then the mocking of Christ, then the ascending the cross, which is the most fascinating part, and then procession to Calvary. And here are the two um, close-ups. This is flagellation, and this is the ascending the cross. And whoever the artist is, he is interested, well, to an extent, in, uh, in anatomy. And he's trying to convey the anatomy uh, as uh, naively as, uh, as it looks, but he is trying. In fact, with flagellation, what we see here is Christ while he is standing with the flagellation pole, uh, not, not looking particularly hurt, but and his body is turned to us so that we can indeed see he is, uh, if not six-pack, but at least four-pack. And this one I actually never encountered before, uh, the idea of uh, Christ, in fact, ascending the cross by himself all the... Uh, paintings I had seen uh, were where Christ first is nailed to the cross and then raised uh, with the cross, notably Rubens or Caravaggio. And, but here he's actually ascending the cross himself with help of, uh, of others. So I went looking for it and it seems that it does exist. Here's what I found. But it does exist uh, in some parts. Uh, it's a very rare image. Uh, here I found one, circa uh, 1300, from uh, Macedonia. And here Jesus is voluntarily climbing up onto the cross. And there's a Greek inscription that ultimately reads, Jesus Christ ascending the cross, or more colloquially, the literal translation is Jesus Christ climbing up onto the cross. And then uh, I found some others, uh, not many, but some others. So this was rather fascinating. And here is the Russian version, and it certainly gives the, uh, the artist the opportunity to convey the half-nudity of Christ as best he could. And there is, in fact, some, uh, some reality in the image, some, uh, some true feeling in the image as, uh, as the man is climbing up with the help of others. Now we go back to Kiev uh, for a bit. Uh, well, as I said, nothing really was left in Kiev after all the devastation that um, the city uh, experienced. And I showed you a reconstruction of uh, what the very first church perhaps looked like, the Dysitichnaya, the one to which Saint Vladimir the, the Duke of Kiev, who, received, who was the first to receive Christianity. He gave uh, to the church one-tenth of his possessions, and as a result, it's called the Tithe Church, or the Stichnaya Church. 
Uh, here's another reconstruction, uh, slightly different, but basically the same idea, all built by um, the Byzantine uh, artists, Byzantine masons and the Byzantine architects. Everything was brought from Byzantium. But the church was completely destroyed. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. The second church in Kiev was this was the Hagia Sophia of Kiev, which was built uh, to uh, compete with the Hagia Sophia of Constantinople. It was a very large church, and that too, for the most part, was destroyed. So what we, uh, look, what we are looking at here is a considerably later building. The original building was uh, founded in uh, 1037. It has preserved some of its original pictorial decor because even though the outside church today probably looks nothing like what the original church was, the, uh, nevertheless the architects did attempt to preserve the interior of the church. Here it is. Uh, Kiev was pillaged uh, a number of times, not less by, and uh, by Andrei Bogolubsky of Vladimir Suzdal, and that happened in the middle of the 12th century, and then a huge devastation that we uh, saw last time in the middle of the 13th century. Uh, then it was damaged in the 16th century uh, when the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was trying to unite Catholic and Orthodox churches, and then, and at that point the cathedral was really just practically ruined, and then it was Co uh, and then it was claimed by um, a Moldavian Orthodox priest uh, by the name of Pyotr Magila. Magila in Russian actually means a grave. He commissioned uh, the repair work. Well, we are now in the 17th century and our Peter Magila uh, commissioned his uh, uh, artists, his architects from Italy. And, uh, and they built the church as you see it here. In fact, a lot of churches in the Moscow Kremlin are also built by Italian uh, craftsmen, by Italian architects and Italian masons in what the Russian style was perceived to be, the Russian Baroque style. And so is this church. This also is built by Italians. Inside, this uh, is uh, an original uh, mosaic. Uh, of a Pantocrator, and in, around him are the four archangels. All of them, except one, uh, had been uh, painted by uh, a brilliant artist, actually, Mikhail Vrubel, uh, in the 19th century, and they were painted in oil because they were destroyed. But uh, just one, right here, the figure in blue, that one is the original mosaic, so that uh, we still have that. Um, here is the uh, Pantocrator, very Byzantine Pantocrator. Uh, the face expresses nothing. I mean, we saw certain expressive faces on icons uh, today. This face expresses nothing. He just stares at us um, indifferently, blessing us with a book again under his uh, under his arm. Great striations everywhere. No chiaroscuro. Uh, well done by Byzantine artists, uh, very two-dimensional. And uh, here are uh, Jesus Christ in Greek letters. Uh, here is what it looks like from uh, bottom up. And on these two pillars, as we look up, we see the Annunciation right here. And here it is. It's the same idea, the Annunciation, Archangel Gabriel announcing to Mary, Behold, the maiden shall conceive, and as his uh, words reach her ears, the conception happens. And they are the two piers uh, of the eastern arch of the cathedral. Here they are. And it is interesting to observe the difference in the faces this is the Ustuga Annunciation from Novgorod, and that goes back to the early 12th century. And uh, this is the Kiev Annunciation, and this is the 11th century. And again, while there's urgency 
in the face, in the Ustug face, really delightful urgency, the face of the angel on uh, uh, in the Kievan cathedral is uh, inexpressive. Uh, underneath, right there, next to the Annunciation, is the obsidial vault right here, and there's an enormous uh, mosaic of uh, the Madonna Orans depicted depicted there and she also is 11th century she also is original here she is uh, very two-dimensional very inexpressive again very byzantine but the colors are beautiful uh, and when you look at the blue madonna is very often portrayed in blue as the celestial madonna and uh, once blue is contrasted with the warm gold in the background the uh, effect of the colors is um, is very compelling.